Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to be talking about how you generate an action potential. Now we learn about action potentials when we talk about nervous impulses and it's one video that I've had a number of students request that I uh, make and I'm actually going to use the kind of images and the notes that I use in my lesson on this because it's quite a detailed topic. So what I'm going to do is talk through all of the notes that I have on here and explain it in hopefully a more easily understandable uh, manner. Now you can't actually see, this is a, a normally an animation of a Mexican wave ultimately, but I use this with my own classes and I start off asking what is this an analogy for and why? Perfect analogy. And it's because if we take this guy here at the front, if they do a Mexican wave and if he stands up and raises his arms and then everyone else does and we get to the guy right at the end over here, We've ultimately transmitted that Mexican wave. It's gone all the way down here. It's worked its way all the way down this row. But this guy here in position one hasn't moved at all. He's still there. And this is an analogy for a nervous impulse, or more specifically, the, an action potential. Because that guy isn't actually physically moving down the line. Nothing is moving down a nerve axon as such. So when we think about a nerve impulse, it's important to remember that nothing is actually physically moving down the axon. It's all about, and if we think about this particular uh, guy in this picture, he's moving up, he's moving down, but we're getting this Mexican wave moving across. So it's actually the movement of things in and out, or up and down in this analogy, in and out of an actual cell, rather than things physically moving down. And now this, if I just move on for one moment, this is a tip straight from the examiner, and I, I use this as a really key reminder for my own students, that nothing physically moves down the axon when a nerve impulse is generated, or as it says there, more specifically, an action potential is generated. It's really important to remember that. So when you're answering questions about this, that you're not saying that something is physically moving down an axon, it's actually all about the movement of ions in and out of the cell at specific points of time. Now what we've got here is a cell membrane. We've got a cell membrane here. This is the phospholipid bilayer. Now the reason why I've included this image is because there's four things to just be aware of about this particular cell membrane. It's really important when we think about action potentials and movement of things in and out. So I show this and then I ask my students, under what circumstances would a molecule not be able to freely diffuse through a membrane? So under what circumstances would it not be able to pass through this membrane? And circumstances would be if it's not lipid soluble. So I'll just make a note of these. So it wouldn't pass through if it's not lipid soluble. Equally, number two, if it's too large, if it's too large, it wouldn't go through. Number three, if it's repelled by a charge on the pro protein channel. So we'll put repelled by a charge. And number four, finally, is polar and can it pass the hydrophobic tails in the bilayer. Now, the reason why these particular four things are important is because they kind of set the scene for the start of this action potential. Because, as I said, this action potential, this nervous impulse, is all about the movement of ions in and out of the cell. And it's really crucial that we know that things don't freely just move through that bilayer. Because we ultimately, if we've got something that's not liquid-soluble, that's too large or repelled, for example, we're going to have to use an active method of moving things in and out. And that's really crucial for what I'm about to explain. So... We come to the bilayer basics. So before we talk about the action potential, it's important to talk about the bilayer as a structure. So we're talking about the phospholipid bilayer. So in this, this part here, we're talking about ultimately like a cell membrane of the axon. Now the axon is an extension of a neuron. Now I have done a separate video on the structure of nerves and neurons.
people are going to presume in this video that you've potentially watched that one. So, phospholipid fire of the axon, or plasma membrane specifically, prevents sodium and potassium ions diffusing across it. We've just said that the sodium and potassium ions would kind of fit under the four categories that we've just mentioned of things that wouldn't naturally pass through freely this cell membrane. We've got what are called intrinsic proteins. Now, if we look at this diagram at the bottom, if we'll just label a few bits, so we can see this is the cell membrane here, so the bits that I colour in yellow here, these are our phospholipids, and we see the heads of the phospholipids, and we've got the tails pointing inwards, we've got outside and inside labelled here. Now these things, if I shade them in red, these are what are called intrinsic proteins because they're proteins that span the whole width of that membrane. You can get ones just for the sake of argument. I'm just going to draw one in over here to the right hand side. You can get proteins that are just embedded into like the top portion of the cell membrane and those we would call extrinsic well, extrinsic proteins, but for this process, we're more concerned with these intrinsic ones, the ones that go all the way through the cell membrane. So I just wanted to add that extrinsic, just as a little reminder about the cell membrane. So we've got these intrinsic proteins called gated iron channels. Now, these can be opened or closed to allow sodium and potassium to move through them at some points and not others. So if we have a look at this picture at the bottom, you can see that it says in blue here, that these channels are normally closed, but even when they're closed, they have some leakage. Sodium can leak in and potassium can leak out down concentration gradients. So we're referring to these bits here, this leakage. So we've got a leakage of sodium in. So it's really crucial to remember that we've got sodium leaking in and here, potassium leaking in out because that's the opposite of what we have just where I've got this asterisk here because in the middle we can see that we're getting sodium out and potassium to move in now this bit in the middle this is referred to or I should say this protein as the sodium potassium pump and I will talk about it just in a moment or two, but you can see that this is a protein that is going to actively be used, so we're talking active transport here, actively be used to pump sodium out of the cell and potassium in. So we've got, the name suggests Na, sodium, K, potassium, ATPase, so it's a particular protein channel that we're going to use in the formation of ATP and use ATP, that form of energy, to actively pump these two things. And you see at the bottom here, we've got ATP being used and broken down into ADP in and inorganic phosphate. So we're using energy, we're using ATP to push sodium out and to pu push potassium in. But you've got to bear in mind that even though we're pushing for take sodium, we're pushing sodium out, some of it is naturally leaking in and some of that potassium that we're pushing in is naturally leaking out. So it's really important that we distinguish between those uh, ionic movements that are happening. So we are actively pushing sodium out, but it's leaking in. We are actively pushing potassium in, but it's naturally leaking out. So let's continue the story. Okay, so let's just talk in a little bit more detail about this sodium-potassium pump with a key definition. So we've had the idea that sodium actively pushed out, potassium actively pushed in, even though they're leaking in opposite directions. Now, what's key is the number of sodium potassiums that are pushed out. So we're using ATP to simultaneously pump out sodium-potassium, but this number here is crucial three sodiums are being pushed out and two sodiums are being pushed in. So if you imagine, if you use this diagram, if we're pushing sodium out, boom, there's three of them, and we're bringing potassium 
in, but only two of them. Ultimately, we're pushing out much more than we're bringing in. And both of these ions have a positive charge, so we are pushing out more of this positive charge. So if we're pushing out more positive charge, even though there is this leakage, we've said that we're pushing sodium out, but it leaks in. We're pushing potassium in, but it leaks out. But if we just forget that for a moment, if we just look purely at this kind of square that's on the screen, and we talk about this sodium-potassium pump, if we're pumping three sodium out and two potassium in, we're ultimately pumping out more positive charge. So what you get, as this paragraph says here, is a negative charge building up inside of this particular cell, this neuron. So we get an overall negative charge inside of this axon because we're pushing out what is positively charged. And the charge goes down to what's called minus 70 millivolts. It's the resting potential. And what we've got at the bottom is a spec definition for resting potential. The electrical potential across the plasma membrane of a cell that is not conducting an impulse. Now what's really important here is this idea of not conducting an impulse. We haven't generated this what's called action potential yet. We've got nothing uh, moving along this axon. This is just at rest, hence why it's called the resting potential. So this is what's happening in all of your neurons, in all of the nerve cells in your body, when they're not conducting an impulse. They are at this minus 70 millivolt uh, phase, if you like. They have this resting potential of minus 70 millivolts, because of this sodium-potassium pump. We're pumping out more positive charge than we're bringing in. So we have a negative resting potential of that cell to begin with. Now, three key things to remember before we really build, build up this story of the action potential. So three key things to remember are these three. Number one. That the membrane is 100 times more permeable to potassium. Now, we said at the very beginning that potassium was leaking out. So we're actively bringing two potassium, two K pluses in, but it naturally leaks out. So if we're saying now that the membrane is 100 times more permeable to potassium, that means we're leaking out even more. So we said potassium was leaking out, sodium was leaking back in, but we're leaking much more potassium. So combine the fact that we are pumping out, actively pumping out lots of sodium, or more sodium compared to potassium, and we're losing some of our positive ions from inside the cell, but we're now actually leaking a lot more positive potassium ions, we can see that that cell is becoming particularly negative. That's going to help us get that negative resting potential. It says here, this further increases the potential difference between the negative inside and the positive outside. Key thing to remember number two is that as well as there being a chemical gradient, so chemically we have, for example, more sodium in one place than another, more potassium in one than another. We also have this electrical gradient because of the charge difference. So it's got there, as more potassium diffuses out and the inside becomes more and more negative, you've got this electrochemical difference, this gradient. So the outside is positive, the inside is negative, the positive will try to move back in, move towards that negative side. And eventually, we've got here number three, eventually we reach a balance or an equilibrium where the chemical and electrical gradients are balanced. So the key, really, the key thing to take away here is that because we're, the membrane is 100 times more permeable to potassium, not only are we we're bringing in two, but we're leaking out a lot, lot more. So we have such a high level of potassium outside of the cell. So potassium is trying to get trying to get back in, but also it's trying to get back in to balance that electrical uh, difference, the electrical charge difference. So we reach this equilibrium and that equilibrium is ultimately at our resting potential. So this is a uh, just the start of the story really and this is what I show my students. The fundamental five. This is what I 
break this story down into five key steps. So when you're coming to revise this, I like to revise it in these five particular steps. It gives it a kind of all coherent order. So let's talk through my fundamental five. So number one, going from resting potential to an action potential. So an action potential actually occurs when that neuron starts to send information down the length of the axon. We've said that there's a resting potential of minus 70. But at minus 70, some of those potassium voltage gated channels are open, but the sodium ones are closed. And that's really crucial, the fact that these sodium voltage gated channels are shut. Because this whole story begins with sodium. So let's move on with the story. Number two, we get what's called depolarization. So when we stimulate, when we stimulate that particular neuron, the membrane potential is briefly what's called depolarized. If we think polar as being something charged, depolarization would be removing that charge. So going from minus 70 almost to zero, removing that kind of negative charge that we've got. So as it says here, the stimulus causes the membrane at one point of the neuron to increase permeability to sodium. So here is the start of our story. We're increasing permeability to sodium. So sodium begins this story. The sodium voltage, so there should be a plus there, apologies. The sodium voltage gated channels open and sodium would then enter the axon down the electrochemical gradient by diffusion. So if we think for a moment, we said that sodium was leaking in, but we are actively pushing out three sodium for every two potassium. So there's a lot of sodium outside of the cell. What we're saying is the moment that we've stimulated this neuron, these gated channels open and all of a sudden, as you can see in this image here, these gated channels open and all of a sudden this sodium just rushes in because there's more sodium outside, less inside, so it goes down its concentration gradient, but also down that electrical gradient difference. A lot of positive outside, more negative inside, so sodium rushes in. So if we were to look at this particular graph that we've put at the bottom, what we're saying is, if we continue this, we've got resting potential at minus 70, and what we're trying to do now is get this to move towards zero. So we're heading in this direction. We're moving above resting potential. As it says here, it's really crucial, it's causing the resting potential to move towards naught millivolts, because we've rushed all this sodium in to our axon. So let's just think for a moment about what this term means, this threshold level. So fundamental uh, five, number three is the second part to depolarization. So depolarization part two. When we reach minus 30 millivolts, so if I were to draw this red line in, go up here, when we reach minus 30, so we're saying this level here is about minus 30 millivolts, we reach what's called a threshold value. Now that threshold value, lots more sodium channels open, only for 0.5 milliseconds, that's a bit of off-spec information. So what we're saying is these sodium channels open, so these sodium channels in red, these voltage-gated sodium channels, so we're not talking about the sodium-potassium pump, this is just the normal sodium channels, intrinsic sodium channels, they're open, all this sodium rushes in, at minus 30 millivolts at this threshold level, even more of these open, so even more of these sodium channels open, I've only got one in this picture, even more sodium rushes in, and that causes sodium to really rush in into the cell. And the cell, as a result, becomes more positive. So we get towards this zero millivolts. So what was our resting potential of minus 70 is now down to zero millivolts. The cells become a lot more positive because we've had potassium, sorry, sodium, rushing in. What we have now is the peak of the action potential. So once the action potential actually reaches around plus 40 millivolts, these voltage gates of the sodium channels actually shut. I should put a little plus there. So these channels actually close. So our graph, if you like, 
we had a scale that went, if I just redraw it here, we had minus 70 millivolts here, we had zero here. And time on the bottom, we said it was minus 70, it passes the threshold goes up. What we find is actually we go above zero. We actually take this graph well above zero up to around here to around plus 40 millivolts. And at that point, all of these sodium channels close. So what we've had happen really is we've set up a point where we've got resting potential, where it's more negative inside. And all that's happened is these sodium channels have been stimulated to open and this sodium has rushed in. So this sodium has just rushed into the cell. Once we've got a more positive state within the cell, once it's reached this plus 40 millivolt, those sodium channels have closed. So nice and straightforward there. Now once those sodium channels close, what's really crucial is this part here. That the potassium channels, adjacent potassium channels, we'll colour these in blue, they start to open. And as you can imagine, we're now flooding out these potassium channels. We're letting these K plus ions leave the cell. So what was a positive state now, if we go to this graph, we're now going to end up taking it back down to a negative state. This graph is going to go down because this potassium or these potassium ions are leaking or rushing out. So this is, for me, step five. So number five is what's called repolarization. So repolarization, becoming polar again, becoming charged again. And hyper repolarization. So as I said, we go above zero millivolts, we go up to, minus, to plus 40. The same thing happens almost, but like the reverse. We almost take out so much potassium that the graph goes actually below minus 70 for a very brief period. So as it says here, the potassium rushes out and it makes the inside of the cell negative again. So we've got the cell back to a negative state. And since we're restoring polarity, this is called repolarization. So we have ultimately a period of depolarization followed by repolarization. But there is, as I've alluded to, an overshoot in the movement of potassium. So a lot more potassium goes out, especially if we remember that we said that the membrane was more leaky to potassium. So at the bottom, we've got this potassium channel open here. Not only do we have this potassium being uh, or diffusing out of the cell, but remember, it's a lot more leaky to potassium, it's a lot more permeable to potassium. So the cell actually on the inside, in the axon, becomes more negative than we wanted to originally. And that's called hyperpolarization. So it goes ever so slightly more negative beyond minus 70 millivolts. Now at that point, that's when, it says here, the gates of the potassium channels close. Now when they close, we trigger what's called the wave of depolarization in the adjacent sodium channels. And so we spread this impulse. So it's a bit like our Mexican wave. So sodium channels open, sodium rushes in, then they close. That causes the potassium channels next to them to open and the potassium rushes out. It restores resting potential. But when that happens, they will close and adjacent sodium channels next to them will then open. The sodium will rush back in. They will then close. But that causes potassium channels to open. Potassium will then leave again. So notice, as I said right back at the beginning, nothing is physically moving down the axon. It's all about sodium potassium moving in and out at various points along the length of the axon. So just like our Mexican wave, things moving up and down, things moving in and out of the cell, but nothing is physically moving down. But we are transmitting this nerve impulse, this action potential along the length of the axon. And we've got a key definition here at the bottom of action potential. It is the reversal and restoration of the electrical potential. So electrical potential being minus 70 millivolts, we're reversing it and then we're restoring it ultimately. So the reversal and restoration of the electrical potential across the plasma membrane of a cell as an electrical impulse passes along it. And our two phases are depolarization and repolarization. So taking it to ideally towards zero millivolts and then repolarization taking it back to our minus 70.
And here, ultimately, to summarise, is everything that we've just talked about in this video. We start with minus 70 millivolts, rest in potential. We can see this red line, it moves up. In this yellow uh, region here, we've had the sodium channels open. The inside of the cell becomes more positive. At a threshold, more sodium channels then open. We reach this peak, and that's when the sodium channels then close. At that point, at about plus 40 millivolts, that's when our potassium channels start to open. Because our potassium channels open, all this K plus ions leak out. So we're again taking the inside of the cell a lot more negative, comes down. And then we've got a region here of hyper repolarization. And once we've restored resting potential, our potassium channels close. So there we have a little information about generating an impulse or action potential along a neuron. Okay, hope all that helps.